Good morning and welcome to um, Developmental Psychology, um, Psych 250 for the summer 2017 semester at NDSU. Um, today is class 16 and we'll be talking about psychological stressors and risk behaviors in adolescents. Um, as we get started, I just want to go over some housekeeping. Um, just a reminder that today your social problem nomination is due. And you might be like, well, what is that? I don't know what that is. Well, that is a component of the project that we're going to be doing um, in this class. Um, so let me just pull up Blackboard so that you can see um, what you need to do. So under the Projects tab here, um, you'll find more information about the project. And just to go over what the project is about, this is a project that we're going to do as a whole class. So everybody's going to be working together. And the purpose of this project is to assess your deeper understanding and creative application of the material that we're learning in the course. Um, so <clears throat> the majority of you are not here, so I think what we're going to do is we're going to do it by Google Hangouts where we can all talk together and work together. And I'll send out more information about that closer to time. Um, but for this project, what you're going to be doing is identifying a social problem in the state of North Dakota. And that's what's due tomorrow, or due today. And the class is going to vote on the problem that they want to do the, that they want to do the project on. So what you're going to do is look at, the, um, look at the worksheet that I have posted. And then you'll just select the one that you, want to, that you think is the best for us to work on. And then whatever gets the most votes, we're going to do together. And then what you're going to do, we'll have our meetings during the last two weeks of class, <coughs> and we'll assess how the current problem affects developmental outcomes of a vulnerable population. So ethnic minorities, gender minorities, sexual minorities, prisoners potentially, um, children. And we're going to identify strategies to address that problem to reduce the negative developmental outcomes. And you'll be using developmental theory and press practices to come up with these um, to come up with these solutions. And so your your task is to approach this from the profession that you want to be in. So if you want to be a doctor, look at the medical aspect or nurse. Um, if you are psych wanting to be a psychologist, look at the, the mental health aspect. If you want to be a nutritionist or a dietitian, they look at it from the um, nutritional standpoint. Okay, so you'll have to think about it a little bit perhaps to figure out how this will work for your career field, but all of them are possible. And you'll write a little, you'll write a paragraph about um, why that problem will affect development, or why that's pro why the problem is a problem, um, how it will affect development, and then the, the solution to fix that problem. And so we'll all do that. We'll all write a paragraph or a couple paragraphs. It'll end up being a one-page document um, for each person. And then I'll create a single document that we'll then send um, to the governor and to the president of the university to highlight how smart you are. So what you'll need to do for today by 11.59 PM is go down here and click on the social problems nomination. And it's just like the quiz that you take. And then you'll just pick one of these. Um, so the options that you have are food instability amongst Native American populations, lack of mandatory insurance coverage for transgender health care, such as hormones, surgery, and mental health, lack of anti-discrimination protections for LGBTQ plus North Dakotans, housing, employment, hate crime laws, lack of access to affordable women's health care in North Dakota, for example, pap smears, mammograms, STD, STI testing, contraceptive, abortion services, or poor recruitment and retention of students of color and faculty of color in higher education. So native students, students of African origin, students of Asian origin, students of Arab origin, etc. And so think about the long-term developmental implications of these problems, physical, cognitive, academic, social, psychological, etc. Think about your own profession and and think about what you're interested in writing about and then uh, make your selection and then I'll let you guys know as soon as everyone is submitted I'll let you know what we're going to be working on together okay so you'll just pick one and click save and submit just like you would a quiz and that's worth five points of the 40 points that you can get for doing this project
and I'll send you more information about the project um, as soon as we get the topic I'll send a formal assignment sheet so that you will know exactly what you need to be doing right now it's all up in the air because I don't know what we're gonna be writing about and so once I figured out what we're writing about based on your submission then we'll from there I'll have better um, idea of what the project will look like okay <clears throat> so let's get started <clears throat> with our class today <clears throat> today we're talking about two highly related things and that is psychological stressors and then risk behaviors in adolescents um, I originally gave this lecture, this was the first lecture I ever gave as a college instructor, and um, it was a given in this form, or it was combined like this. It, in the past, because it's such a long lecture, it's had to be divided into two lectures, and so this is the first time in a long time that it's delivered the way it was originally written. All right, I love this lecture. I'm a preventionist at heart, so I'm very much passionate about preventing negative outcomes, and so I really like this lecture. I hope that you do too. Why is there a huge gap in my PowerPoint? Every week, right? Every week, there's something wrong. Oh, I see. <laughs> See, I know this lecture, and I don't know it at the same time. Okay, so we a lot of times when we think about teenagers and we think about the period of adolescence, we think of moodiness. So this this idea that adolescents are really grumpy and have a lot of negative emotions, and we call we usually in our popular culture will say, well, it's because you're going through all these hormonal changes. You're just being hormonal. Um, but there is a question that we really need to answer and is do hormones cause moodiness is this association really is there cause and effect here is there even an association and what we found is that there's a modest link between the fluctuation in hormone levels and early, in early adolescence and depression and irritability in boys and depression in girls in other words yes there seems to be a link but we can't really say if it's it's not strong it's modest and we also can't say that there's a cause and effect there. Um, and this is just an early adolescence. And so when we're talking about a modest link, let's think about our correlation. Oh, Lord. <laughs> our correlation. So we run a correlation study, and we find that for every increase in hormone, there's an increase in, oh, that's not what I wanted it to look like. for every single increase in hormones, there is an increase in moodiness. So moodiness is up here and hormones is right here. And we see a modest link, right? So it's not, it's not a straight line, which would be no link. And it's not a sharp line like that, which would be a strong link. Um, it's just, it, there's, there's somewhat of an incline. So it's a very modest link. But that's just an early adolescence. That's not throughout the whole period. So that's like in those early years of being a teenager. By late adolescence, there is a weak relationship between hormones and mood, um, which means that there's just a very, very small, the line would be like that, right? Or it would basically be a straight line. One of the studies that gave us this information is the Larson Beeper studies, and these are really fascinating studies. And it was the first time technology was used to collect data in real time. And what Larson had his participants do is he had, gave them a beeper. I don't know if you know what a beeper is, but it's a little, little digital box, like a precursor to a cell phone, and you would call it, and it would buzz, and it would give you the number that was calling you. And so what you would do, you wouldn't obviously wouldn't call back on it. You would take the beeper, take it to a phone, and then you'd dial the number. So it was a way for people to let you know they were trying to get in touch with you if you were out and about. And so what Larson did is he gave all these adolescents beepers, and he would buzz them throughout the day. And when they were buzzed, they had to report how their, what their mood was like. 
and he also did it with adults. And what he found is that adolescents report more mood fluctuations than adults, but not more than young children. In other words, there isn't really that big a change in, in moodiness between kids and adolescents. Um, affect with family drops between 5th and 7th grade, but rises again in ninth grade for boys. So affect, positive affect, good feelings, drops between 5th and 7th grade. But they, for ni ninth grade, it starts to get better for boys. Um, affect with friends, though, increases during adolescence. So the positive feeling, the positive relationship, positive emotions you have with your family go down, but then the ones with your friends go up. Moodiness, in fact, from what Larson found, seemed to be tied to context. So it's not that adolescents are more moody than we think that than, than, than they are. Or it's not that adolescents are more moody than children or more moody than adults. Um, it's, it's that there's more context in which those, that moodiness can be um, triggered. Um, and also, I think some of it has to do with psychological aspects too where we perceive children as being or adolescents as being ad adults and we forget that they're also still children they're really still children that are transforming into adults and so we we seem to overemphasize the moodiness aspect of their behavior that being said adolescents do find their life during this time period is very stressful. Um, in fact, there's high rate of psychological disorders in adolescents. 32% um, of teens have some form of anxiety. 25% uh, have a mood disorder like depression. 20% have a behavior disorder. 11% or use substances, illicit substances. And then 3% have eating disorders. So very large, over a quarter of adolescents do experience psychological distress that qualifies as a disorder at some point in their lifetime, or at some point in their lifetime during adolescence. And I want to just briefly define what a disorder is so that we're on the same page about this. Um, a disorder is a formal diagnosis, and that what that means is that you experience symptoms which one, meet all the diagnostic criteria for the disorder. So you have to meet certain criteria. Two, it has to be persistent. So it has to last for a specific amount of time. Three, it has to cause you distress and impairment, meaning you have to not like the fact that you're experiencing it and it has to prevent you from doing the things that you would normally do in any other circumstance. And if all of those have been met, then you have a disorder. You can be a little depressed, but not actually have depression. You can be a little anxious, but not actually have anxiety. You can have a bad behavior sometimes without having a disorder. You can drink and smoke, though you ought not if you're not old enough. Um, but you can drink and smoke without having an addiction. You can have disordered eating, but without having a formal eating disorder. You just have trouble sometimes with your, you know, portion control or where, or with um, with the choices you make about when you when you eat what you eat. So when we talk about psychological disorders, we're talking about a formal definition. They meet criteria for an actual disorder that is an actual medical condition and not just part of everyday life. Because it's normal for us to be a little bit depressed sometimes. I mean, that's just part of everyday life. But for it to drag on for two weeks or more, that is a disorder. That's a problem. Anorexia nervosa, so we're going to talk about eating disorders, because um, these are some really prevalent issues that are faced by adolescents. And um, anorexia nervosa is one that we commonly associate with, um, with teenagers. And this is a combination of fear of fatness and extreme restriction. So you're afraid of getting fat, like you are literally terrified of becoming fat. And you're uh, terrified that you are fat. In fact, you might see yourself as fat, even if you're like this skinny. Um, and then there's extreme restriction with that. So you're dieting, like you're eating, like I'm going to eat one wheat thin today, and that is everything I'm going to eat today. Not enough food, by the way, for anybody. Maybe like a tiny bird if you crush it up, but not not for a human being. Um, or very extreme exercise. So you eat like normal 
but you're exercising like five or six hours a day. Or, worst case, you're, you're barely eating and you're exercising a lot, like way too much. Typically with anorexia, we see a loss of 25 to 50% of body weight and severe health issues that accompany that. Basically, you're starving to death. And so you, we see a lot of the same symptoms as like marasmus or quashiacord, depending on what you're restricting on. For girls, menstruation stops. And the reason? Well, because you couldn't maintain a healthy pregnancy if you got pregnant. So it's a safety, it's a sort of a built-in safety feature to keep you from dying. Um, some of the physical things you see, brittle hair, nails, dry skin, and interestingly, the return of lanugo. We talked about lanugo, uh, lanugo um, when we talked about birth. You know, that's that weird thick hair that covers a baby's body. Well, that reappears during if you have anorexia because it helps to keep you warm because you don't have enough energy to stay warm. Because the calories, which were of often what people try to restrict on, calories are just units of energy, right? And so you want to make sure that you have as much energy as possible. And if you're restricting calories, it doesn't give your body enough fuel. It's like restricting, putting not putting enough gas in your car and then trying to drive to Bismarck on the half tank of gas. You're not going to make it all the way. You're going to break down eventually. Now, while we associate anorexia with girls, it does still it does still happen for boys. About 10% of all cases are boys, um, so boys can be anore have anorexia, but it it's a little bit more rare. Um, the prognosis is not great. It's 50/50. 50 percent of people recover from anorexia nervosa, 50 percent die, um, or struggle with it for the remainder of their life. Their life will not be long, unfortunately. You can't live this way for a long time. Um, anorexia has a very high death rate. Um, and unfortunately, it's incredibly hard to treat. So um, definitely not a disorder that you want to have. Not that you would want to have any of them, but if you had to, if you had to have one and you had to pick, this would not be the one you would want to pick. Um, a lot of it has to do with the unreasonable body standards that we have. Um, we, we're not entirely sure what causes it, but we do know that when you live in an, in an environment where there's a lot of highly critical, people are highly critical of their, their appearance, people who have more compulsive tendencies, uh, need to be perfect, tend to have issues with anorexia. Related to anorexia nervosa is bulimia nervosa, and this is actually people think of, when they think of anorexia, this is what they really think of. They think of bulimia. Um, bulimia is commonly, people say, oh, that's just when you eat so much that you throw up, and that's not entirely true. Um, in fact, it's rarely true. Um, bulimia nervosa is a combination of the fear of fatness and unhealthy compensatory behaviors. So it's like anorexia in that you're f afraid of being fat, but instead of restriction, um, you have unhealthy compensatory behaviors. So extreme dieting, for example, um, that is a form of restriction, obviously, um, but not everybody with bulimia has extreme diets. Um, exercise, extreme amounts of exercise, and then binging and purging. So typically what you'll see is a person with bulimia will restrict. They'll restrict, 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 and then on their diet, and then they'll exercise a lot. And then they'll, get, they'll be so hungry that they'll overcome the fear of being fat, and they'll just eat like a ton of stuff. And then they're like, oh, what did I just do? I just wrecked everything. Now I'm huge and fat, even though I just ate like probably – I ate a whole pizza. Okay, well, guess what? People in adolescence typically do that, and you could probably get away with that because of your metabolism. And so they'll they'll purge it. They'll either force themselves to throw up, or they'll take laxatives so that they don't keep any of the nutrition. The unfortunate aspect of that, though, is unless you throw up right away, um, you're still going to get a lot of that. Those calories are going to be burned pretty quickly. Um, also, laxatives are hor a horrible thing to do because you don't end up actually purging any calories. You just it rushes through you, but you still th there's still the transfer of calories. Um, <clears throat> um, 
In terms of bulimia, this is more common in guys. About 2-5% to of girls um, are diagnosed with ner bulimia nervosa, so it's much more common um, in guys. And it has about 5% of the people who have bulimia have been previously diagnosed with anorexia. So it is possible for someone to really start out restricting, 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 and then move into this more bulimia um, mindset. Again, 50% recovery rate. I want to double check that. Because I remember being puzzled by this last time. Uh, okay, so bulimia has an 80% recovery rate. That's that's right. Okay. So make that change on your um, slides. 80% recovery rate if you have bulimia nervosa. So what about depression? Depression is very common. Um, and depression defined, and I'm sure we all have an idea of this because I think everyone in there, almost everyone has been depressed at some point. But depression is a mood characterized by feelings of worthlessness, disturbances in body activity, such as sleep, loss of interest, and inability to experience pleasure persisting at least two weeks. So in other words, you have to have a sort of a, a down mood where you feel worthless and where you're having disturbances, you're not sleeping, or you're sleeping too much, um, you're not eating, or you're eating too much, um, and then there's a loss of interest and an ability to experience pleasures. So you're like, the things that you used to care about, you don't care about anymore, you don't feel up to doing anything, you're just going, oh, I don't want to do anything, and um, you just nothing makes you feel happy. You can also have, um, like, some motor lots like some weird motor behaviors like you may start twitch a little bit it's, it's very it's it's kind of weird you don't think about that being with depression but you do have that and it lasts at least two weeks um, though for adolescents it's one week so if this goes on for a couple days that's okay it's okay people feel depressed it's not a big deal it's part of life depression is our brain's way of saying I'm processing stuff right now that I don't really want to deal with, I can't handle, and I just, this is my way of like slowing myself down so that I don't just completely go completely mad, because that's what would happen if we really did not have depression. Depression is good, it's, it's a good thing, right? The problem is, and this is what happens with a disorder, all disorders, in, to some regard, have something positive about them. I mean, anxiety is our way of, of realizing, oh, something bad's about to happen, um, depression is a way of like saying, hey, I've experienced loss. The, pro the problem is with a disorder, it's, it's taken to an extreme where it starts to control you rather than playing an important function in your life. And so you should be able, as an adult, you should be able to get over and process whatever you're experiencing in about two weeks to the point that you may still be sad, but it's not, you're not having, you're not feeling worthless. You're not losing sleep, you're not eating, fun, having funny eating schedules. Um, for teens, it's one week, of course. So anything beyond that two weeks or one week for adolescents, two weeks for adults is depression. Now, there are two types of depression. The first is ma major depressive disorder. And this is what we typically think of when we think of depression. This is depression lasting two weeks or more to about two months. And then after that point, we start to consider the second type as being your primary diagnosis, and that is persistent depressive disorder. And you may have heard this referred to as dysthymia. And persistent depressive disorder is depression that lasts beyond two months without any one-month period of rest in between. So if you have depression, major depression, for a month and a half, and then it stops, and then you have a month you have like three or four months of no depression and then it starts up again, that would just be two cases recurring major depression. There would be two cases of depression. 
um, that are close, same year, but there's a break in between. You're not depressed for a while and then you're depressed again. Persistent depression is you're depressed and you're pretty much depressed for a long time without any stretch of time where you're having a break. That would be persistent, so beyond two months without any break. Um, persistent depressive disorder is much harder to treat than major depressive disorder. And major depression honestly knocks itself out in about two months. You, you pretty much, can, it, it runs its cycle and you're, you move on. Persistent depression, these are people who are depressed for a long time. There's hardly any relief. It's just awful. They feel awful all the time. That is persistent depression. There, it is possible, though, to have recurring major depression, like I said, though, where you have multiple cases of major depression, where you have at least a month in between them. And this typically happens to people who just have a very difficult life and are easily dysregulated. Um, they'll have a period where things are good, and then things will get bad again, they'll get depressed, and then things get good again. You know, and that's just recurring major depression. It's not persistent because there is a break. And for adolescents, again, I should just, I should say, um, for adolescents, persistent depression is anything over one month. So one week, one month. So it, the time periods are shorter because children and adolescents are more resilient and they should be able to recover quicker. Um, depression is the most prevalent psychological disorder in adolescents. Um, of all adolescents, 67% have reported feeling depression in the past. This isn't depression, major depressive disorder or persistent depressive disorder. This is just feeling depressed. 25% um, report feelings of depression. And then of all adolescents, 3% actually meet criteria for major depression. And so... Um, the number I showed you earlier was like 30 something percent. Those are people who either meet criteria or who feel depressed. This is more, this is lifetime prevalence. Um, in terms of gender and ethnicity and depression, girls have higher rates of depression than boys. Um, there's, and there's a reason for that. Um, the best way to knock out depression on its own is to be highly active because the more active you are, um, the more endorphins you release. The more endorphins you release, the more depression um, is quelled because the endorphins make you feel good. Um, so boys are tend to be encouraged to be active, to go outside, to work it off, to not ruminate on it, and so they tend to get over it quicker. Girls um, are encouraged to ruminate on it, to think about it, to be upset about it. Um, and rumination is actually, in co-rumination, which is when you're ruminating or you're thinking about it, you're talking about it with somebody else, actually pro prolongs the experience of depression, which is what you typically wouldn't wouldn't think that that's the case, because you're like, oh, but that's what happens in therapy. Well, actually, no, therapy's not at all like that. <laughs> There's actually like a, a process that you're going through, whether you know it or not. So. Um, so girls are just conditioned to be depressed for longer than boys. Um, because, because boys tend to run it off or play it off, it doesn't get the chance to develop into major depression because it tends to resolve itself in a couple days. As opposed to if you're just kind of sitting around talking about it, thinking about it, crying about it, it does tend to make it become a disorder. And that's not to blame anyone. That's just what happens when you're not active. Um, unfortunately. And that's not to say that you, there are some people who are incredibly active who are still depressed. A lot of it just depends on your personality and your biology. White people also have lower rates of depression than ethnic minorities. Um, reason for this being there's not as much, there aren't as many risk factors present. Um, so different risk factors for depression are things like you know, I social isolation, um, high amounts of anxiety and stress. People who are ethnic minorities tend to feel both of those things at higher rates, and so they all they tend to also be at higher risk for depression. Here are some of the risk factors for depression. Um, so biological, psychological factors. It runs in families. Um, you can have a genetic disposition to depression, just something that unfortunately happens. Um, another is learned helplessness, and this is when you believe that there's no possible way that you can ever 
fix anything. And so you just kind of, anytime anything bad happens to you, you just kind of give up. That breeds depression. In terms of your social factors, uh, being unpopular is a risk factor for depression as well as experiencing rejection. Um, so again, people who are not well liked, people who um, maybe were well liked at one point but have been rejected, they're at higher risk for depression. Um, in terms of environmental factors, if you lose somebody to death, um, that can be hard. Also, just losing someone in general, you know, if they just leave and they don't want to be your friend anymore, or they break up with you, that can also be uh, just as bad as death. Um, alcohol or substance abuse in the home leads to depression in adolescence. And then maladaptive parenting, if you have parents who are not treating you well um, or who use bad disciplining skills that can lead to depression. Depression, and, and we talk about depression a lot in, in this class because it's, it's so common and it has so many horrible outcomes. If you don't treat it, it places adolescents at higher risk for suicide, number one, and suicide is a horrible thing, um, and we want to avoid that at all costs. Um, academic failure is another you wouldn't think about, but it, it actually, if people who are depressed don't do as well in school. Um, I know plenty of people who've had to take breaks from school because they just couldn't do the work because they were so depressed. Nor it's normal, perfectly reasonable experience. If you don't feel motivated and you don't take pleasure in school, you already don't take pleasure in school. If you don't feel motivated and you don't, don't take pleasure in things, of course you're not going to do well. Um, Social isolation, people with depression tend to isolate themselves, which make it worse. Legal issues, people who are depressed don't make great decisions, so that can lead to some legal issues. And then higher health costs as an adult. The more depressed you are, the more um, your physical health suffers as a result of you not taking care of yourself, of you not eating well. Um, it can put a lot of stress on your heart that can lead to other problems. So as an adult, you're going to have higher health pro health costs because you're going to have to have all these health problems. So it's really important that we treat depression and treat it quickly. Now, we're going to talk about something that is very important to me. And it, I know, is going to be upsetting for some people. And so I want to start this out by saying if you need to pause the, the lecture or you need to not watch the lecture, that's fine. Um, sorry, um, one of you just emailed me and I was just looking at it. Okay, um, so I won't be distracted. If you need to not watch this portion of the lecture, that's fine. I don't have any way of telling you when, what you can skip to, but I, what I will do is I will write it down and I will email it out. So if this is something that you can't deal with right now because of personal experience, you don't have to. I don't know that it's on the exam, but you know what, I'll make sure that it's not on the exam. So email class time frame suicide portion. And I do that because I understand I've, I've, I've lost people to suicide. I personally have experienced my own thoughts of suicide. And so I understand that for some people thinking about this or talking about it, it can be very triggering and I don't want you to be upset. I don't want to make this an unsafe place for you and I also don't want to make you feel um, hopeless or, or depressed. So put that out there. The other thing I want to put out there is if you need to talk to me, I know I'm on vacation this week, but I am checking my email. So send me an email. Um, I'll be sure to look today, especially if I hear my e my phone ding. I'll, I'll look to see if, if it's you. And if you need to talk, we can schedule something where we can talk um, via Google Hangouts or I'll call you and we can talk on the phone. Okay? Um, <clears throat> suicide is something that's very important to me. Um, I I do this job because of suicide. I was um, I've I've made a suicide attempt. I've made two actually in my lifetime. Um, one when I was 
19, and then the other was actually over the Christmas holiday this year. Um, and so this is something that I have personally experienced and that it's really personal to me. Um, I also have family members who have suffered with thoughts of suicide. I've had friends who have taken, um, who have died by suicide, and it, it was very difficult for me to deal with that, especially because of the work that I do as a psychologist. Um, I became a psychologist because of uh, this person right here. Um, his name is Josh, um, and he was an 18-year-old gay man um, from some town in Michigan. I didn't know him personally, um, but he... He, was, he came out as gay, and he was bullied pretty badly, and even though he had supportive friends and families, no one did anything. And he just eventually decided there wasn't any other option, and he died by suicide. And I read about this in the news, and it was after my own suicide attempt, like a year after, and I was not sure what I wanted to do with my life. I'd just gone through some major life changes, and... I thought, you know, it's really upsetting to me that this beautiful person who had all this promise, who was so close to graduating and, like, leaving this small town in Michigan, like, it was so upsetting to me to think that he could have had a beautiful life and contributed so much to make the world a better place, but couldn't because no one did anything to help him. And I thought, you know, I'm going to do something to help people like Josh. And that's why his picture is on my desk. So that I, when I, every day when I'm in the office, I look at him and remember, this is what I'm doing this for. I'm doing it for people like Josh who don't have a voice anymore. I'm trying to make the world better so that people like them don't end up in the same tragedy. And so my research looks at peer victimization and the outcomes of that. And I've been doing a lot of research on suicide behaviors for the last three or four years and um, looking at how we can use friendship and peer relationships to prevent suicide. So this is something that I feel very strongly about. And so this lecture is important to me for that reason. Um, and I'm going to go into a lot of detail about suicide because I think it's important that we reframe this because unfortunately we have this erroneous or wrong belief that suicide is selfish and weak. And the reality is it's not any of those things. It's the result of, it's the eventual and unfortunately very logical end result of a long period of hurt. Uh, it's not spontaneous. It happens because of a long chain of systematic depression, anxiety, abuse, oppression. It's literally the brain saying, I can't anymore. I literally can't even. Um, I had a, I heard a talk where somebody who had also, who's a suicidologist, so someone who studies suicide, um, um, did a talk, he was also a survivor of suicide, and, and did a talk about how he was in Fear Factor, which I thought was cool, and his task is he had to hold on to this, ro this rope wire like 20 or 30 feet above this big like net, and he said eventually his hands just gave out, and he said that's what suicide is like, it's like you're holding on, you don't really want to let go, but eventually you just get to a point where you can't hold on anymore. Unless there's somebody there to grab you, like you're gonna, you're not gonna make it. And I think that's a perfect way to talk about this and to reframe this picture of what suicide is. So what is suicide? Well, the official definition is a process by which an individual may die by their own hand, which includes the following component. So I want you to, to highlight this word may. Okay, because not dying is still it's still suicide. If you think about wanting to die, but you don't follow through with the thoughts, it's still suicide. Um, it's the three components are suicide ideation. These are serious thoughts. 
about death by suicide, okay? So when you're thinking about it, you're experiencing suicide ideation. We often say, well, a person is suicidal. Not a good way to, to frame it. They're experiencing suicide ideation. They're having ideas about suicide. The second component is suicidal plans, and this is the formulation of specific plans to die by suicide. Okay, so thoughts plus plans do not equal a death by suicide or an attempt by suicide um, necessarily. They can exist without a person actually taking actions to follow through. This is just having thinking about wanting to die and these are thinking about ways to die. However, an attempt is when you combine the wish to die and the plans that you've made and you make an effort to die by suicide, okay? So you have to have all three of these components. You can't just have two and three or one and three. You have to also have, you have to have all three of these things in order to make a suicide attempt. And it's important to highlight that because a lot of times we think, well, if somebody just talks about it, if they're experiencing ideation, then they're gonna die, no. Not at all. It's healthy. If you don't talk about this, then this is going to happen. It literally happens in this order. You have to make, if someone is thinking about suicide, the best way to get them to stop thinking about it is to talk about why they're thinking about it so that you can come up with a solution to make the thoughts stop. So talking about it and thinking about it are not necessarily bad. They just mean that the person has reached the end of their, of what they can deal with. Now, suicide is the third leading cause of death in adolescence, and we think about it being this this big, significant problem. And the reality is it's not. It's sort of like plane crashes. You know, we think about plane crashes as being these, like, really um, horrific, terrifying experiences, and they are. But... Because there are so few of them, they, they tend to appear to be much bigger than they really are. And so the f even though suicide isn't, is, is a tragedy and it's horrible and even being third is too many, it's not as prevalent as we might think it is. Um, however, that being said, it's still pretty prevalent. Um, in terms of all of the populations age-wise, um, Adolescents are the second highest population that would suicide um, attempts. So um, white males actually in their 40s and 50s, um, 60s actually have the highest rate of any group um, in terms of age and ethnicity. Um, but that being said, one teen suicide occurs every 90 minutes. And this class is about 90 minutes long, so one teenager will die by suicide during the course of this lecture. And that's really tragic, especially when you you spend your life trying to prevent it. <clears throat> You're like, what am I doing wasting my time teaching a class when I could literally be trying to save a teenager in this 90-minute period? That's, and that's really sad. Um, the, the rate is 12.2 suicides per 100,000 adolescents each year. It's still really high. This rate increases if a teen has substance abuse. So if they're doing alcohol, drinking alcohol, or taking um, drugs, this does increase the risk of suicide um, because adult, because alcohol, and we can go into a whole scientific reason for why, but essentially I actually was on a paper, that, a pr project in a paper that looked at this. Alcohol reduces your or increases your pain tolerance. And so that's one of the things you need in order to make an attempt is you have to be able to, um, it's part of that number three criteria, the attempt. You have to be able to overcome the fear of dying in order to die by suicide, which is why suicide is actually not a cowardly thing to do. You have to actually be incredibly brave to overcome that fear of death. Um, so alcohol and drugs reduce the, the pain or increase pain tolerance and also increase the um, your sensitization or your desensitization to um, painful and provocative experiences. Um, minority groups have higher rates across the board. So transgender teenagers actually have, of all populations, 
um, we believe the highest rate of suicide of any group. Um, because you have to combine the fact that they're a teenager and that they're transgender and that together makes them the most at risk for suicide. Um, native teens are also really up there. Um, suicide is a very prevalent problem in the native community. It's unfortunate, very unfortunate. Um, the other thing that's really upsetting, even though it's the second highest, the, it's the group with the second highest rate of suicide of all groups, the rate is increasing, and it's increasing more in this population than in any other. So it, it's possible that it will surpass um, the, uh, the um, middle-aged white man group um, as being the number one. So it, it, it's not as bad as it could be, but it is getting worse. So if we can actually do something to stop it now and keep it from getting worse, then it could actually potentially be a lot better than it really is, than it currently is. Now, in terms of gender differences, there are gender differences that we've noticed when it comes to suicide. Um, boys tend to die by suicide at higher rates than girls. Now, the highlight on the die. Um, girls make more attempts. So girls make more attempts than boys do. Now, the reason boys die by suicide at higher rates than girls is that boys tend to use violent methods such as guns, hanging, or jumping. Whereas girls, and those pretty much, if you do any of those things, you're pretty much, you have a fairly high rate of success um, because they're very lethal. Girls tend to use less violent methods like drug overdosing, and that's hard to do because it's hard. We, we have this idea of what an overdose would be, but the reality is the dose on medications that they give you is well under what you could actually take. Um, so, it's hard. Um, what I can say, I'm not obviously not going to tell you how to die by suicide, but I, I don't want you to do this, but I also want to just put out there that Tylenol is not a good thing to use. You will probably not die, and it will really, really mess you up. So, just putting that out there. And the reason I put that out there is because most people make an attempt and regret it almost immediately. So, the way this works... So what happens is you get triggered. So you're dun, 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 you're going along and you get triggered and then you start escalating. Okay? And then you get up here to this very narrow window. And this is so this you're triggered, right? And start escalating. And in this very narrow window, this is when you're at your most you have the most risk for dying or making a suicide attempt, right? So you're having thoughts of suicide, you maybe have a plan already and you're like, okay, I'm gonna do it and you have a very narrow window, and then you start to naturally de-escalate without any assistance, right? Because your brain's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, let's, talk, let's, walk, let's, let's walk through this. But in this brief, brief, brief period of time, you, basically your brain is not in control of what you're doing, and you literally can, or your brain is still in control, obviously, but your conscious mind is not in control of what you're doing. And so the goal of therapy, or in suicide hotlines, or in any kind of prevention, is to combat the escalation so that you don't get to this window, so that you start to de-escalate sooner, right? So that's why knowing the warning signs is so important. Um, so what happens is people make an attempt, and if you do a violent attempt, most likely you will not survive it. But if you make a non-violent attempt, what happens is that window ends and you're still alive, and then you're like de-escalating, like, whoa, I wish I hadn't done that. For some people, what happens, this window is so narrow that they may jump off of a bridge, and the window closes, and they're like, I really wish I hadn't done this. And at that point, it's a little too late. Um, sometimes you can survive. People, almost everybody who survived a jump off of a bridge or off of a building has said, I realized halfway down I didn't want to do this anymore because that window had closed and they started de-escalating. Um, and you'll notice <coughs> there, there are videos, like police 
videos where they they're trying to talk someone down and like there's one i'm thinking of this person is literally speeding from the police the police are trying to get them because they know that this person's at risk they get to a bridge they get out they shut the door of their car they slowly walk to the edge of the bridge it's like you're about to jump off the bridge why do you care about getting your car closing your car locking the car I mean, this person is literally doing everything in their power not to do this, and it's their it's their brain, the conscious part of their brain, like doing everything it can to stop it from happening. And fortunately, the police grab them as they are like very slowly trying to climb off. But this is what that's what happens. Like, the window is very narrow, and if you if you're if you're very fortunate, um, you don't do anything lethal within this window. You try something, you maybe you start to do something, but then the window closes and you change your mind. Um, it's in our instinct as, as animals not to die. We don't want to die. We want to resist it at all costs. And people who experience suicide have, unfortunately, overcome this to a large degree, this f being afraid of death, um, to the point that they don't really care what happens to them. Um, but the instinct will always be there. It will always try its best, even if it's buried really deep. It's going to try to not for you not to die. Um, so all that to say, it's better to just reach out for help to try to get intervention. Because if you can do that, you can de-escalate. You'll never get to that place. In terms of the risk factors for suicide. Um, in terms of the biological and psychological factors, if there's a family history of suicide, you're more likely. Um, history of stress and or depression. Like I said, suicide is the eventual outcome of a system of depression, of stress, of abuse. So a history of abuse, a history of depression is going to be a risk factor. In terms of your social factors, if you're isolated or feel inhib inhibited in your ability to interact with others, that will make you feel more like uh, have an increased risk for suicide. Also being a perfectionist um, because you'll, you're never good enough for yourself and that over time makes you feel very isolated. Um, feeling of like you're a burden. So if you feel like you're a burden on the people that you love, that is a risk. Um, if you've just experienced some kind of humiliation or negative relationship, that also is a risk factor. And then um, environmental factors, a current history of neglect or abuse, um, cluster suicide's another. Um, this is when you have, like, at a high school, this happened recently, it was tragic. It ha you hear about it a lot. Well, not a lot, but more often than you want, would want to. Where there's this, this teenager dies by suicide in a high school or a middle school, and then another child dies by suicide shortly after. That's a cluster suicide. It's not that they were inspired by this other person. They wanted to do it, and they just needed they needed some courage to do it, and this other person did it. So like, okay, I can do it too. Um, that's why it's important to make sure that when you know someone who dies by suicide, especially in a school or church setting, it's important that you talk about it with young people, with everybody, but especially with young people, so that they have the ability to talk about it and to be non-judgmental about it, too. Because um, if you're non, if you're judgmental, I feel like the worst way to react to someone who, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. And then family conflict too. If there's like instability in the home, that's a risk factor. So what are the warning signs? How do you know? Well, if there's direct or indirect talk about suicide, you should listen. If they make jokes about suicide, if they're like, I'm just going to kill myself at the end of the week, that's a warning sign. You should always ask, why do you feel that way? Like, you should ask. <laughs> Don't be afraid to ask. Talking about suicide actually is healthy. It's not unhealthy. But if they're talking about it and you're not validating it, you're not talking to them about it, then that is not good. Um, difficulties at school. Always, when their student is having difficulties, you should check in with them and make sure they're okay, especially if you notice them isolating. Um, making arrangements. This, like, if they're saying, hey, will you watch my dog? If anything happens to me, will you take care of my dog? Will you take care of my mom? Um, oh, yeah, I'm selling a bunch of stuff right now, trying to, like, pay off my debts. Um, writing a will, changes in eating. If they have depressive symptoms, their sleeping is off. Or, or different if they're sleeping more. 
um, this is a big one, dramatic behavioral changes. If they're suddenly a very different person, that is a definite warning sign that something is up. Um, people who, especially in, in one really good example, is if this there's a person who's always like very flighty, they never really have any plans, they're not very stable, and then suddenly they're very calm and stable, and they have they seem to like have a plan. They've resigned themselves. Usually, what happened is they have a resolved plan to take their to to die by suicide. So. That is a warning sign that you should look out for. Sudden interest in death is another. Um, if a person is like interested in de death and dying or death culture or like, I don't know if they're like into memento mori, I don't know. Like that's, that's a warning sign. If it's something that they've had for a long time and they're not depressed and they're not making arrangements, if there's any other warning signs, they're generally just a cheerful person. They just, they're fascinated with death like they want to be a, a mortician okay that's fine that's not it's sudden if it's sudden if it's like they're they're more interested in death than they normally would be or the normal person would be that's when you should start worrying so what do you do well you should print this out and put it in your pocket and keep it forever because you never know when you're going to have to do this and i will tell you as a suicidologist i see suicide everywhere i it's almost to the point where I feel like I overreact, but it's probably a good thing because apparently I've saved a couple people. Um, if a friend or a loved one is thinking about suicide, if it comes to your attention, you should do something. Always react. Always do something. Never, ever be afraid of overreacting or hurting their feelings or getting them in trouble because if they really are thinking about suicide, they will thank you for it 5, 10, 20 years down the road. Um, I promise. Um, the first thing to do, though, is to remain calm. People panic. Because they think, oh, they're gonna, they're going to attempt suicide right now. No, most people, if they are telling you that they're thinking about suicide, it is because they want you to stop them. People do not talk about the, their suicide plans. They don't disclose those things unless they actually want someone to do something. So if someone says to you, I don't want to live anymore, don't be like, oh my God, they're going to do it right now. They're dangerous. I don't know what to do. They're just that is their way of saying help. I need help. So remain calm, take some deep breaths, it's going to be fine. And then just be caring and being empathetic. Just don't go off the handle, don't say, well, what are your parents going to think? What are your kids going to think? What about your friends? What about me? Because that makes them feel like an even bigger burden than they already feel. So you want to just be very calm about it. Why do you want to, why do you feel that way? Um, you know, I've had patients disclose to me that they're going to, as soon as they get out of the hospital, they're going to die by suicide. And I think, and my reaction is, hmm, well, do you not think there's any hope? You know, what's going on? Why do you think that? You know, it just, be very calm and kind about it and concerned, but not overly concerned. You just, you just kind of want to be there with them in that moment and just be like, I'm here. I'm here to talk. I'm here to be here for you. I'll be here to do what you need me to do. Now, the next thing that you need to do after, after you've calmed them down is you need to tell someone else. Um, tell an adult. Most of you are adults. That's kind of a weird thing to say. Um, or a professional. Um, usually what I would recommend doing is... See, I'm, I'm a special case because I used to work as a therapist. I have a su former supervisor. I have a lot of psychologist friends. Typically, I will just talk to them. What you would, should probably do is call the National Suicide Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255 um, and tell them what's going on because they're professional and they can help you. Um, now, if the person is at risk and you're talking to them but they're not convinced they're going to do it anyway and they're like not at all, like they're not trying to work with you at all, just call 911 um, and let them deal with it. Um, stay with the person, obviously, but you should call 911, and that'll take. They'll take them to the. They'll get an ambulance to take them to the hospital. I mean, that's unfortunately when people are unwilling to do things to be safe. Like if you're trying to help them be safe, and they just refuse to be safe. They don't want to be safe. They don't want help. Sometimes you just have to call 911. It's unfortunate. Psychiatric inpatient is literally the worst place ever. But 
it's better to be inconvenienced for a couple days than to be dead. So it's hard. It's hard. I, you know, I've I've had to call nine one one before. I, I don't like doing it. I don't want to do it. But you also don't want someone to die. So I mean, it's it's a hard it's a hard place to be. But that being said, if they're w willing to work with you to come up with a safety plan and they'll stick to it, there's no need for them to go to the hospital. You The, only, the hospital only exists. This, there's a myth that you go to a mental hospital to get better. That's not true. You go to a mental hospital to stabilize. If you want to get better, you're going to have to do it outside of the hospital in therapy. So if you can, it's better to just stabilize at home. You know, if you can stay with a friend for a couple of days and they can watch you and keep you from hurting yourself, then that is the better thing to do. Because then you just get in with a therapist and you work it out and then you're able to cope in the real world instead of being removed and isolated in this basically a prison where you're just basically being watched all the time so you don't hurt yourself. So, you know, that's my that's my 10 cents on it. Like. Call 911 if you have to, if there's absolutely no way that they can stay safe on their own, but do your utmost to get them stabilized, to help them, really to help them help themselves, because ultimately they need to be the ones to stabilize themselves, and you're just there to help them. So that's that would be the ideal. But again, if you don't know what to do, just call Lifeline 1-800-273-8255, or talk, if you want to remember it that way, um, and they will help you out. They'll literally tell you what to do. You give them the person's address. They'll even dispatch 911 for you if they feel it's a risk. So it's a it's a good uh, it's a good resource and it's free and it's confidential and it's available every day all day. Now let's talk about let's move away from talking about um, psychological issues and psychological disorders and start talking about risk behaviors. And the reason this lecture works well the way that it is is because these risk behaviors often happen as a result of untreated psychological disorders. In other words, people have to cope in some way with the horrible things that they are experiencing, and so a lot of times they turn to these very risky behaviors. And I'm just going to say right now, we're going to go over 80 minutes today, but that's okay because two of the lectures this week are super short, like 20 to 30 minutes. So um, it's it'll all even out, I promise. Typically, typically if I don't finish a lecture in a class period, I'll just continue the next class. But because this is online, we can just do it this way. So just putting that out there. Okay. So. Auto accidents actually, of all things, account for the highest rate of death among adolescents. And in 2010, it was 200, uh, 2,700 adolescents. Uh, in 2013, it was 2,163 adolescents. So not really that different. Um, and in 2013, there were 200, almost 250,000 um, adolescents treated for auto-related injuries. And so you can think about the many different ways this could take place. I mean, obviously car wrecks are the ones that spring to mind, but also people riding in the back of trucks or uh, people clinging to the hood of a car while they somebody else does donuts in the parking lot. I mean, we've all done it. Um, all of those things. Um, but car accidents, most most of them are, caught, are car accidents. Um, it's important to think about it from this perspective. Teens only account for 19% of the population, right? So a very small portion of the population, but they c account for almost over a quarter of auto-related accidents. So it's disproportionate to their their portion of the population. What makes driving more risky? Well, if you're a male, two times more likely than females. And the reason for this is guys tend to be much more impulsive and take much more risk than girls do. So that's why. Uh, passengers. So every every teen passenger you have with a teen driver increases your risk. So if you have five teens in one car, that is a risky car. You do not want to be in that car. Um, experience is another risk factor. So there's a high risk of a driving accident within the first month of li few months of licensure, um, and a lot of that's due to underestimation of danger. The 
the lack of safe practices are also a big factor. So low seatbelt use, for example, um, is very prevalent in this population and is a huge risk factor. DUI, another big factor in this population, speeding and tailgating. So driving too close and driving too fast. Driving without all of your um, faculties being around and <laughs> not wearing a seatbelt. It's just kind of a recipe for disaster. That alone, this alone is bad enough, but then you have to think about all these other things that are happening. What about substance use? Well, substance use is also pretty high. Um, we actually can categorize substance use into two different, or substance users into two different categories. The first are experimenters. And these are people who are just seeking some kind of pleasurable experience. They want to escape sort of this turbulent time that, teen, that is adolescence. Maybe they just want to thrill from doing something illegal, or they feel pressured into doing it. These are people who are just trying it. They're not people who are making it a way of life. Um, that's most people. Now, the, um, there is a minority of adolescents who are abusers, and these are people who have physical and psychological dependence. So this is a way of life for them. They have to have it, or they will be physically ill. In terms of the prevalence of substance use, marijuana um, is pretty prevalent. Not as prevalent as alcohol, though, in cigarettes. Um, in middle school, about 15% try marijuana. In high school, about 45% try it. Um, inhalant, so like sniffing paint, stuff like that, glue, Sharpies, Sharpies smell really good, I have to admit, I like the smell of a Sharpie, um, I don't, obviously don't huff them or sniff them, but I do like the smell of a Sharpie, um, I think I, I got in a contact high once from doing a poster with a Sharpie, I was like, afterwards, I was like, the world was like, woo, it's like, oh, this must be what feeling high is like, <laughs> so lame. I've never been high in my life. I don't, well, I've been high on, like, caffeine, I guess. Because caffeine's a drug, right? It's a mild drug. Um, so inhalants, middle school, 11% try, high school, 8%, so it goes down. And the reason for that is inhalants are easier to access in middle school. Like, if you can't, it's hard as, in, as a middle schooler to get alcohol or marijuana or cigarettes, because they require that you actually, or have the autonomy to move about. Um, but inhalants, you can basically huff anything in your house, anything in the in the cupboard under the sink will get you high if you smell it long enough. So like, it's it's more prevalent in middle school because it's easier to gain access to them. Um, alcohol, very very prevalent. Um, in middle school, 10% try in sixth grade, 26% in eighth grade try, and 17% in eighth grade use. So the difference between trying and using is trying is like one time or two times. Use is like regularly. In high school, 66% try, 2% use, so pretty low. But then this is awful. Almost a quarter abuse alcohol, so are physically dependent, and that's because alcohol is highly addictive. Um, cigarettes. The use of cigarettes is going down in adults, but it's actually going up in adolescence. In middle school, 14% uh, try and one and a quarter or one and a half use it, and then in high school it goes up a little bit. 35% try and then 3% use regularly, and that a lot of that has to do with the ease of access. I've never smoked either. I've I obviously have had alcohol, but I've never done any of these other things, so I don't really know what the appeal is. But apparently it's fun. I don't know. I mean, I think eating ice cream is fun, but. What are the risk factors for using substances? Um, typically, low impulse control, people with low impulse control do really well with substances because they react quickly and they the less control you have over your impulses, the better it works. So <laughs> it tends to be a recipe for disaster. Uh, people who are highly moody or depressed also tend to use substances more as a way to um, cope. Um, not the best way to cope. Um, family history of addiction too. Um, if you have a family history of addiction, that can be a very significant risk factor. In terms of the social and environmental factors, 
if you live in a, in a culture or a neighborhood or a community with very low moral views or lax moral views regarding controlled substances, there's more likely to see, you're more likely to see adolescents using them. Um, and that's not to say that there's anything morally wrong with drinking or smoking or partaking in or partaking of the Mary Jane. Um, I mean, I'm not making any judgments about it. I, I don't smoke or partake, but you know, uh, I, there's nothing wrong with it. There is something wrong with it when you're too young though, because it can have very, very negative effects on you. But if you're an adult, who cares? You know, if you, if it's illegal, if it's illegal, I think I have to say that you should care, but family conflicts and permissive parents and uninvolved parents. Um, <laughs> I had an office moment. I should have done, I should have done from a profile. <laughs> I can't say what I would say, but all I would say is I'm not here to tell you what to do. Okay, so... <laughs> Um, family conflict, permissive parents, um, and uninvolved parents or other risk factors. Um, if you have parents who use or peers who use, that is another risk factor. Where do you think you're getting at? There are parents who actually give their kids drugs and it's like, dude, like, not cool. Like, it's one thing to let your kid try a little table line, but I mean, to let them get just give them all the alcohol and let them get drunk and drive around. That's irres That's bad parenting. That is irresponsible. Um, and then community culture. So I won't tell you what to do, but I will say that. That is irresponsible. If your child, if you're giving your child a six pack a, or a 12 pack or whatever of alcohol and letting them out, letting them go out and do things, that's, that's irresponsible. That is, that is a recipe for a disaster. Um, I will judge you for that because I, Mm -mm. Children are our future, man, and they need to love and they need to be nice, but they don't need to be drunk and drive them drunk. It's not not cool. It's gonna mess our future up. Okay, and then the community culture. Um, that if you live in a culture and a community where drug use is very prevalent, or there's like people don't really care, then you're gonna have a higher use of higher rate of use of substances okay yay my favorite part <laughs> um, the sexually transmitted infections these are um, infections which are predominantly spread through sexual intercourse in other words you can only get them if you have sex now you can get them through the, the exposure to blood, so that would be an exception where you're not actually getting the infection transmitted sexually. Um, as a sort of a, our base understanding, adolescents and young adults, so our population and the one below us, make up 25% of the sexually active community. So we're only a quarter of the people having sex. But we account for 50% of all new STIs, so that is incredibly disproportionate. That we're not having all the sex, we're having only 25% of the sex, but we're having half of the STIs. So that's not good. That needs to go away. That's a bad rate. And the reason it's bad is because a lot of these STIs, while treatable, can have very negative impact on your long-term physical health. Some are not treatable. Some of them, you can only, like, have treatment that help to reduce the uh, the pain or the irritation or the negative effects of them, but you can never get rid of them. So, like, we got to do something to get rid of this. This is a bad number. Um, the most common STIs in adolescents are gonorrhea. 70% of all cases of gonorrhea are in adolescents. Chlamydia, or as I like to call it, the common cold of the vagina. It's incredibly easy to catch, but also incredibly easy to get rid of. Just put some antibiotics up in that mug, and that gets rid of it. 63% um, of all chlamydia cases are adolescents, and then HPV is very common. 49% of all HPV or adolescent STIs are, or all, sorry, HPV cases are um, adolescents. And actually, half of Half of all Americans have HPV, so it's incredibly common. Um, it's 
important though to to check to have the have you know tests done to make sure that you don't have it because it can actually affect your reproduction ability to reprodu re reproduce. STIs are transmitted vaginally, orally, or anally. So basically, anytime you have sexual contact in these very sensitive areas, you can have the transmission. Um, I will note that anal sex is incredibly risky for this reason because the lining of the anus is incredibly thin, which means that it can tear easily and tears are bad because tears lead to um, open the bloodstream up to any fluid transmission. And so it's the, the way that it, the way that you get infected is you have to have contact with a fluid, a bodily fluid and the bloodstream. So like just having like infected b infected body fluid on my hand is not necessarily going to transmit to me if there's not a single cut on my hand then it won't, there's no possible way for the infection to get into me because my skin exists as a barrier now whether you knew this or not you have minuscule cuts all over your body maybe they're the size of a mustard like a little mustard seed or a poppy seed, but they're minuscule. You can't even see them with the naked eye, but they're there. And so that's why it's important to wear gloves when you're coming in contact with other body fluids. Um, so that's how it's transmitted. Um, also, if your genitals come in contact with sores or lesions, those sores um, have pus and other leaky stuff that's gross and that can get in and also transmit it. And then body fluids, blood, vaginal fluids, semen, breast milk also transmits, so you have to be careful if you're breastfeeding. Um, so basically, you have to be really careful because you can get it. You know, you can get all of these things. If you come into contact with these things, you could potentially get an STI. Now that's not to say that it's not safe to interact with people with STIs. Um, if they spit on you, it doesn't transmit through spit, so that's not a problem. Um, you can use the same toilet as them. As long as there's no blood on the toilet, you're fine. You have to come into contact with, with blood, like actual amounts of blood or some other body fluid. You can swim in the same water. Um, you can even be married to and date someone with like HIV or HPV or herpes. You just have to take extra precaution. It's not like you can't associate with people with, a, with an STI. It's just you have to be careful in terms of sexual contact to make sure that you're not transmitting or receiving. Okay. Another risky behavior. So obviously we're talking about risky sex, right? And so teenage pregnancy is another potential risky uh, outcome of risky sexual behaviors. And so uh, the number of teenage pregnancies in the U.S. has fortunately been de significantly declining 45% since 1991. I was born in the year 1992, so since I was born, it's gone down almost half, which is really good, but it's still too high. Um, the pregnancy rate is 43 births per 1,000. So for every 1,000 births, 43 are from a teen mother. Not acceptable um, because teenagers are not barely able to take care of themselves, much less another human being. Um, even with our decline of 50%, the U.S. is 2 to 10 times higher than any other industrialized country. So um, the, close, the country we're closest to is still, we're still 2 times higher than them. And then the, obviously the country with the lowest rate, we're 10 times higher. So the U.S. is lagging far behind. And there's a very clear reason for this. It's not that teenagers in other countries are having less sex. It's that we are having less protected sex. Um, interestingly enough, people like to talk about black teenagers and black teen mothers, but white teenagers are more likely to get pregnant. So... Put that in your little racist, your little racist meerschaum pipe and smoke it. Tired of that stereotype. Sick of it. Okay. In terms of teenage pregnancy and its prevalence in North Dakota, 
North Dakota has a very high teen pregnancy rate, which is awful because our state, while the size of a huge square, only has the size of has less people in it for this entire square than in most major U.S. cities. So we have not very many people, but we have a very high rate of teen pregnancies. On average, we have 659 teenage pregnancies with a mother less than the age of 20. This is a decrease of 26% since 1988. So we are decreasing. We are seeing that, that decline that we're seeing nationally, but it's still really high. And you're like, well, 659 isn't that bad. That's 659 out of a little over a million people. That's bad. Um, nationally, we're ranked 31 out of 51 in terms of teen pregnancy rates. So one is the most. So you want your number to be higher. So we're 31. So we're, you know, a little, we're not as bad as it could be. We're not Mississippi, but we're still pretty bad. We're ranked 48 out of 51 in terms of population with 48 the higher the number there being the worst number so not good and our sex ed by law is abstinence only meaning our sex ed consists of telling people not to have sex now let's compare ourselves to Minnesota Minnesota has 4,081 teen pregnancies. And you're like, oh, well, that's worse than North Dakota. Yeah, the population is, like, so much bigger than that. Like, the biggest city in Minnesota has more people than the state of North Dakota. So 4,081 is not unreasonable. They've seen a 40% decrease in teen pregnancies since 91. So they're seeing something that's more on li in line with the national average. They're ranked 44 out of 51 in terms of teen pregnancies. So again, the bigger the number is the better. Uh, 21 out of 51, this is where the smaller the number is the better uh, in terms of their population. Um, so they have a pretty large population and they don't have that many teen pregnancies but proportionally speaking. And the reason they've seen a decrease is because they have abstinence only and comprehensive sex education mandated by law, meaning the majority of Minnesotans are taught how to have safe sex. Um, so, I mean, the numbers don't lie in, in all the states. We'll talk about this. So, um, in terms of teenage pregnancy, well, what are the outcomes? Well, teenagers are less likely to finish high school if they get pregnant. Well, I should say girls are less likely to finish high school. As a result, they're not going to get a good job, and they're going to have to rely on public assistance. So the economic cost of teenage pregnancies is pretty high. The social cost is pretty high. Um, they're more, more likely to be poor as adults, so you pretty much are set up for a pretty bad, um, a pretty bad um, future if you have a baby. Um, as a teenager. Um, and it's not just about you. The children themselves are more likely to have poor educational, behavioral, and health outcomes over the course of their lives. Now, I'm not saying all this to be judgy about teen moms. I'm judgy of the system that puts them there, um, a system that does not teach them how to protect their bodies, to take care of their bodies, um, a system where people go to college and have sex for the first time and had no idea what to expect. That's not acceptable. Like, when I was, when I was, I grew up in a cult, I think I've said, and I went to a you know, Christian university within this cult, and um, they gave us, like, five sex talks the first semester I was there, and they were all abstinence only, like, you don't have sex until you're married. And you're like, okay, well then what? What am I supposed to do when I get married? Does God come out of heaven and tell you, like, magically what to expect or what to do? Because I literally had no idea. And then, like, wh what is the outcome of that? Well, the first time you have sex, you have no idea what to do. You have no idea to keep yourself safe. If you're with someone who's already had sex, you're relying on them to tell you what's normal. So you don't know what's normal. So you could end up getting an STI or getting pregnant because they're like, oh, well, if you, like... I don't know if you do shout after you have sex and you're not going to get pregnant. False. That's like one of the worst things to do. Um, doesn't work every time. Um, like, or they say, oh, pull out is very effective. It's not. So, I mean, if you're not taught how to protect yourself, that's how women get into these situations. Because 
they're they're with people who potentially lie to them or they themselves don't know any better it's even worse when the person's never had sex before either and so like you suddenly have no nobody in the situation knows what they're doing it's all instinct at this point well the instinct is to reproduce right if your instinct is to reproduce and no one's taught you how to have sex without reproduction as being your end goal then guess what you're going to reproduce or you're more likely to reproduce that's the whole point of the activity is to reproduce and if you're running off of instinct then that's what's going to happen right so then we sit here and we're shocked like how did these people not know how to protect themselves because we didn't teach them how it's so funny to me because people are scratching their heads like, what do we do? What do you do? Maybe just tell people about sex. Be honest with them about it. Talk about it. Be open about it. It's normal. It's part of life. Jesus. Like, <laughs> I just get so irritated by this. If you can't tell, when I get irritated, I just start laughing because I don't know what else to do. So anyway, that's my soapbox because it's so tragic to me that teenagers get into these situations that then ruin their lives, that ruin the lives of their children and potentially their grandchildren, all because we couldn't be bothered to not be, to be discomforted for like 20, 30 minutes while we taught someone about condoms and about what sex is about. So what really works to prevent teenage pregnancy? How can we prevent this problem? I should have made this, I should have made this one of our, um, one of our topics for our project. That would have been fun. Um, well, evidence-based teen pregnancy prevention programs work, obviously. Programs that are developed by scientists um, that have been demonstrated with science to, to actually work. Um, so that's good. Um, expanding access to Medicaid family planning services is also good. The reason lower income people have more children is they can't afford contraception. Um, they don't want to use condoms. And I get it. Condoms are, are disgusting and hard to use and they apparently reduce pleasure. I don't, I mean, I don't know. I don't care one way or the other, to be honest. Like, I, I don't really understand the debate about that. It's like a little bit more pleasure uh, or an STD. It's like <laughs> it kind of weighs out for me. But, um, but you know, if you're a married person and you're not worried about your partner transmitting STDs to you, then you're like, well, I don't care. I'm not going to use a condom. But then you get pregnant. Whereas if you're a middle class or upper class, you can afford birth control. So expanding access to these same family planning services that people have who have insurance actually reduces pregnancy. And then promotion of same sex, uh, same sex, safe, that too. <laughs> promotion of same-sex practices does, in fact, reduce teen pregnancy, um, but safe sex is what I meant to say, <laughs> um, because obviously if you're practicing safe sex, you're less likely to get pregnant. What doesn't work? Abstinence-only sex education programs, because people are going to have sex. It's our instinct to have sex. It's unreasonable to expect people not to have sex. Is it better for people not to have sex? Absolutely. You should have sex when you're ready with someone that you trust and who you care about. You shouldn't be leaping into bed with someone when you're in high school. I'm, it's just, it, you're not going to have a, a affirming experience. Like, that's just my opinion. Um, but the reality is people are going to do it. And so instead of, like, telling people not to do something, you should tell people how to do it safely. And actually, when you tell people how to do it safely and you're open with people about what it is and what it's like, people are less likely to do it because there's not some mystery, some scary, like, this, this specter that you want to, that you're, like, wanting to learn more about because people make it so elusive and special when it's really just, like, eh, whatever. And then virginity pledges also are, like, the least effective. People, like, these virginity wedding things with, like, teenage girls marrying their dads. I don't even want to start on that. That's, that, to me, I don't understand it. But they're not effective. Eighty percent of people who do that end up having sex and having sex with multiple partners, um, unfortunately. So not effective in the least. Unfortunately, though, the majority of states have these abstinence-only programs, and then all of those states, every single one of them, have horrible teen pregnancy rates and horrible STD rates. And we're like, why? Bonjour. Like, 
I, I'm from a state where this is a thing. Alabama is much worse than North Dakota. And there we're probably also having sex with our cousins too, so. <sighs> okay, so how, <laughs> oh my god. Tips for safe sex practices. <laughs> I didn't mean there was no literally no pun intended there with the tips. Um, how can we how can we have safe sex? Well, this is where the prevention of sending comes out because I'm like, oh, let me talk about sex with these people. Um, the first thing is to know that consent means all people agree to have sex, and we have a problem in our country where people do not understand what consent is. So let me talk, tell you what consent is. Everybody is agreeing to have sex. I can't use, I cannot use these little figurines because that will scar me for life. These two people both want to have sex with each other and they're okay with it. That is consent. Now what that means is that minors and those with intellectual disabilities cannot consent. So you can't be an 18 year old or a 20 year old or a 30 year old or a 50 year old or what have you and have sex with someone who is a minor they cannot consent they do not understand what they're consenting to therefore they cannot have you it's not consensual the same with people with intellectual disabilities they cannot make an informed intelligent decision with all the facts with a complete understanding of all the facts it is not consent also, people who are incapacitated, drunk, cannot consent. If you cannot drive a car, then you cannot have sex. There is no question about that. If you do not have the judgment that it takes to drive your frickin' car home, then you cannot have sex, because having sex is much more complicated and much more risky than driving a car. So, people who are drunk cannot have sex. That means if these two people are drunk, they neither one of them can consent. They cannot have sex with each other. Now, they probably will, but they ought not. And if you are not drunk, and this person is drunk, and you're telling them that you want to have sex, and they're letting you do it, then that is bad, because you are making a decision that they cannot make. So just remember that. That's the first tip. The second tip is to use a barrier to prevent pregnancy and STIs. Condoms are very cheap. They're free all over college campuses, um, health departments. Um, the ones that the state of North Dakota buys are horrible, um, but they're cheap. They work, but they're just low quality. I mean, they're so fun. It's like putting a Walmart bag. It's like, what is this? Um, they're 79 to 82% effective when used correctly. And so they're good. They're not, it's not a fu foolproof way of preventing pregnancy or STIs, but it's 82% likelihood is good. Um, you should use condoms for all types of penetrative intercourse. That means you're putting, something is being put into something else. Um, so vaginal, anal, and oral with non-monogamous partners. If you are not monogamous, then you need to be using a condom. If you're monogamous, then you probably don't need to have one. Um, pull out is not effective. So if you're like, well, I'm going to have sex, but I'm going to pull out, no. Because the way ejaculation works is you release a little bit, a little bit is being released the entire time you're having sex, right? And then there's a big burst where a lot of it's released. But you've, you've been releasing, right? And as you pull out, you may still get some in there. So you can't say, I'm just going to use... I'm just going to use pull out. It doesn't work. It is not effective. Um, douching is not effective. It's not. Maybe 50% of the time, if you're lucky. It's, but it's not reliable. You should not rely on those two things for your safety. The other thing is to use a dental dam, which is basically, it looks like a, well, it looks like one of these post-it notes about this size. And it's just made out of like latex, and you just set it over an orifice that you wish to visit with your mouth. So um, it does not reduce, in my opinion, it does not reduce 
the pleasure that you get from it. It, it does protect your, your mouth from being uh, exposed to genital warts and other oozy things that you don't need um, and you don't want. Because herpes, when it gets on your mouth, is disgusting. I mean, it, it's disgusting anywhere, but on your mouth, it's like it's humiliating and disgusting at the same time. Okay, um, so you've got your barrier on. You should lube up. Using lube is very important. And people are like, oh my god, Darcy, why are you talking about this? But because I talked about earlier how when you get tears in your vagina and in your, um, your anus, that increases the risk of transmission. And so if you're not properly lubed, if you're just ramming something dry into something else that's dry or not very wet, you're going to have a lot of friction. And friction, um, friction makes tears, it makes burns, it makes other things that um, make it much less pleasurable, number one, but also increases the risk of transmission. So if you use lube, not only are you being safer, you're also enjoying it more. You should spend the money. Actually, the man should. Um, women should never have to pay for um, for condoms or lube because they're the ones that have to carry the child. They have more to lose, so they don't have to pay. Um, so <laughs> it's true, though. Ask me if I have a condom. So you better be bringing your own picnic supplies. All I have to say about that. Um, spend the money on an actual lube. It's really cheap. You can get, Walmart has a really good one that's like super cheap, like dollars. Like we're talking, I think a dollar ninety nine. I don't remember, but it was like ridiculously cheap. Um, they're designed specifically for this and that's the best thing to do. But if you have a problem, like if, if, it, if you weren't planning on it, you weren't prepared, you have a condom, but you don't have lube, you can use conditioner or lotion, Make sure to have alcohol in it, because alcohol will dry that mug out and it will hurt um, and will work in a pinch. Now, one time somebody asked me, can I use Purell hand sanitizer? Let's read the instruction or the, the, the ingredients in a hand sanitizer. Oh, ethyl alcohol. No. Dry that mug out. It'll hurt really bad. You do not want to do that. Mm -mm. People do not think. All right get tested regularly. That is also very important. I had a student email me last semester after this lecture, lecture asking me for advice about when to get tested and like if he should and I'm like please don't ask me this question. Please don't email me this question. You know ask Planned Parenthood. That's what they're for. Um, but you should get tested regularly. Um, STIs are transmitted through bodily fluids um, and there's a much higher risk with anal and vaginal sex, so remember that. Um, so you need to, if you're having sex regularly, you need to be tested regularly. Um, most tests are free at community health centers, but you have to ask. So if you go to your doctor's office, you probably will have to pay. Insurance may cover some of it, but not always. Um, so it's better to just go to a community health center. There are clinics that are specifically for free STD testing or STI testing. Plant Parenthood is a great place to go. It's fairly inexpensive. Um, there's another clinic here, First Choice, I think is what it's called, but I don't know anything about it. Um, um, so just do your research before you go, obviously. Um, my rule of thumb that I use is one month if you're having multiple partners, three months for a new monogamous partner, and then every six months. Even even once you're married, just throw it in there. It's like, just, just to be sure, just to be safe. These things can lie dormant for years. You want to make sure that you're, you're staying safe and that you're keeping your partner safe too. The last tip, I think. I'm pretty sure it's the last one. You're like, please let it be the last one. I'm about to die. Okay. <laughs> okay. There should be no pressure. You should not feel like you have to do this. This should be something that you want to do. So your partner isn't telling you you have to do it, or they're not saying things like, you don't love me if you don't want to have sex with me, or, you know, I don't feel like we have a real relationship because we don't have sex. That is pressuring and that is wrong. That is not consensual sex. If you do not want to do it, if you've been convinced to do it, that is not consensual sex. 
um, if you're not ready, don't have sex. And I know that sometimes this lecture comes across as me telling people you need to have sex. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. If you don't want to have sex, then don't have sex. More power to you. Like, wait until you're married. Wait until you're in a committed relationship. That's fine. If you want to have sex with multiple partners, you're like, then go ahead. If you're like, Darcy, I'm having sex right now. Okay, I don't want to know. But that's fine too. Like, it's completely up to you. Um, the other thing to know is that that because pressured sex is not consensual sex, you can back out at any time. If you decide halfway through, I don't want to do this, I changed my mind, then you can revoke consent. You can say, I don't want to do this anymore. That's fine too. And guess what? If they don't have a barrier and you don't have one either, you can say, well, I changed my mind then. It's a, it is not... Uh, it's not up for debate for me. If you don't have a barrier, you ain't getting any. That's okay. And there's no shame in waiting or not waiting. This is about you and your body. And the reason we talk about this is I know that the majority of you probably have never had this conversation with anyone before. And I want to make sure that you have it. Because this is your body. This is about your health and your safety. And if if you're not feeling safe and you're not feeling appreciated or valued and you feel like you're being forced or rushed into anything, then it's not right and you shouldn't be doing it. Um, so that's, that's the message. This is about your body and your health. And it should be something that you want. And it should be when you want it and with the person you want it with. No one should tell you otherwise. No one should force you any other way. So I'm not advocating that you have sex today or tomorrow or whenever. I'm just saying when the time comes, I want you to know what to do. All right? Good. Um, unfortunately, people do not understand consent. And I am fully aware that a percentage of this class will probably have been raped at some point. And that is wrong. And I am so sorry that that happened to you. Um, it is despicable. It is absolutely unacceptable. And I'm sorry that that happened to you. If it has happened to you, or if you know someone that's happened to you, or heaven forbid you have need for these resources in the future, on campus we have the Sexual Assault Prevention and Advocacy. It's an Office of Student Life. Um, I put their link here. I know the 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 advocate personally, she's amazing, a wonderful person to talk to. This is a great resource to reach out to if you need help while you're at MDSU. If you'd rather go into the town, um, the Rape Abuse and Abuse Crisis Center, the RAC, um, is also very good. Um, pretty, you know, pretty wonderful, actually. Um, and they exist. It's a free resource that's available for you at any point if you need it. So these are just some resources. And obviously, I know that some of the topics that we talked about today may have been difficult and um, you know I understand and if you need if you need to talk if you ha are distressed by the mental health discussions that we had by the rape discussion mini rape discussion that we had or anything else um, you or if you're just concerned about your mental health or your loved one's mental health know that we're here for you you can um, you can email me or give me a call um, that is my um, office number for my nonprofit, but I answer it. So you can send me a text with your name, and then I'll call you back. Um, you can also call the Counseling Center at NDSU. Um, their website's there, or 701-231-7671. Or, of course, Lifeline is always available at lifeline.org or 1-800-273-8255. All right. We're here if you need anything. Um, please reach out if you need help. Um, to prepare for class for tomorrow, read pages 415 to 421 and think about the question, what is a family? Uh, remember, you're responsible for watching Mean Girls on your own this week and your social problem nomination is due by 11.59 p.m. tonight. All right. Have a wonderful day and let me know if you have any questions and I look forward to... Oh, there wasn't a discussion. Was there a discussion?
I don't think there was a discussion. Hmm. Okay, your discussion for today. Whoops. Um, oh, man, I can't believe I forgot the discussion. You're like, Darcy. I know, but we have to have a discussion. Otherwise, you're going to hate me at the end of the semester. Okay, so <laughs> I quickly have come up with a discussion question that I definitely put a lot of thought into. Um, what was one thing that you learned today that you didn't know? I know that we talked about a lot of things, and uh, this is the longest class that we've ever had, and I'm like literally exhausted. Um, so what was one thing that you learned that you didn't know? I'd be interested to hear. Um, and um, that's it. All right. I will see you. <laughs> I will see you next time. Have a wonderful day. Let me know if I can do anything for you. Bye.